Welcome back to another episode of Do Business, Do Life. We have special guest Ann Hyatt here with us today. Welcome to the show, Ann. Thanks, Brad. Well, this is, I was woke up this morning. I was excited. <laughs> uh, I didn't read your book. I listened to it. Uh, I've got a nice little commute, so I, I downloaded it on Audible. And um, such a fun, diverse background you come from. So <laughs> we, we're going to get into that, but you you have a, I don't know if you have a sales background, but let's just say you could because the hook you open your book with is quite the hook, which is, hey, I almost killed Jeff Bezos. And I'm like, what? But, you know, how how did this come to be? So let's just dive right in. I, I have to hear this story, and I'm sure the listeners will be very intrigued with it. Yeah. So uh, my very first job out of undergrad was working directly for Jeff Bezos at Amazon. It's a long story how I even got that seat. Um but yeah, just a few months into working for Jeff, I got one of my first direct project assignments. I was 22 years old, my first big girl job. Um, so I was really excited to have a project assigned to me. And uh, we can get into the long story, but uh, at the what could have been the end of that story and my career, yes, there was a moment where I thought I had literally killed Jeff Bezos. Um, should we get into the details of- Let's do it, happens? yeah. Okay, so- um, Jeff came to my desk one morning and he had a white piece of paper with a series of long series of numbers on it. And he said, and I want to visit these properties next week. We've got Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday to do it. And off he went. And I thought maybe this was some kind of like brain teaser or a joke because they were not addresses, but I figured out eventually that they were GPS coordinates, which I thought was strange, but whatever. And this is again, pre Google maps didn't yet exist. So I had to figure out using the old fashioned way where these properties were in the middle of nowhere, West Texas. But as I plotted them out, these properties were too far apart for him to visit all of them the amount of time that he'd given me. We'd chartered a jet. It was the first time I'd ever done that. And um, there's only one runway. And it was too far to drive to each of these five ranches that he wanted to visit. So I went to my manager, John, and I told him it's not possible what Jeff has asked for. And he didn't even look up. He, John just said to me, no is not an answer. So I went back to my desk and thought, okay, I can't bend space and time to make these places closer to each other. We can't move the jet. The car takes too long. Mm, helicopter? <laughs> so I went to John and said, maybe we should hire, hire a helicopter. He said, sure, do that. I'm 22. I have no heli helicopters in my Rolodex, no experience in hiring one. But I went to, through the charter company and ended up heli uh, chartering my first helicopter. Off he went uh, the next week to West Texas to look at these properties and came back excited as a kid on Christmas morning. He had loved what he'd seen. He had narrowed down the properties and he was considering two finalists to decide which one he was going to buy. I and not anyone else on the entire planet knew what he was doing buying property in West Texas. But uh, at this point, I have a helicopter guy. I have one in my Rolodex. And so he went back the next week to look at the two finalist properties. At this point in my career, three or so months into my time at Amazon, I really started to appreciate how little business I had having this job. I didn't understand tech, to be fair to me. Nobody really did. This is uh, 2002. Um, but I had a notebook on my desk where I kept track of all the acronyms I didn't know, all the people I'd never heard of, the publications that were mentioned, the books, and I just treated it like school. And so I came in hours before anyone else at the company. So it was early one morning, only I and security were in the building and I was doing my self-imposed homework and my desk phone rang and it was the charter pilots. They had never called me before. Um, and they say, Anne, I don't want to alarm you. So instantly, I'm very alarmed. Uh, my hands start shaking so much, I can hardly hold a pen to write. And they say, there's been an, em an emergency beacon has gone off, and there's been a helicopter crash in the area. We don't know if it's him. It's just one of those automated beacons, but um, we thought you should know. And this is the moment where I pause, and I think, I have just killed Jeff Bezos. And not only Jeff, but the entire company, because at this time, in 2002, Amazon is not yet profitable. All of our investors pretty much have only Amazon standing as one of their last remaining dot-com survivors. Mm. And so yeah. I could have single-handedly taken down the entire organization. Now, pause for a moment. Think how different the world might be today had he actually died in a helicopter crash that day. But thankfully, we all know that that's not how this story ends. Uh, he did not die. However, it was him. 
it took me a couple of hours to figure out what was going on, oh. but he did crash and in the helicopter, the very first helicopter I had ever chartered in the middle of n- nowhere, West Texas. Um, I have a feeling he likes telling this story because he was truly a superhero in this moment. I literally still get sweaty palms every time I tell this story, even 18, 19 years later now. But um, he saved everyone. He pulled out. So the helicopter had crashed and cracked open like an egg in the only water within probably 100 miles of where they were. And uh, the pilot, the ranch owner, and Jeff's personal assistant were trapped inside. He single-handedly saved all three, climbed up to the top of the hill next to where they crashed, and used the satellite phone that I had insisted he take to call for help, which is really one of the only reasons I can tell this story is because he used his real name on that 911 call. And later a journalist who was investigating the private space race figured out why Jeff was in West Texas, which was to buy the property, which is now blue origin from which he shot himself into space just last October. So I, um, yeah, tried to think, what do you do if you've killed Jeff Bezos? And so I call my manager, John, and I say, tell him what's happening. And I say, I think we need to put together an emergency board meeting because at this point, I still didn't know if it was him, if he was dead, alive, injured, et cetera. And uh, assembled a board meeting of people who'd never even heard of me before because I'd only been here a couple of months. And we had contingency plans depend for every possible scenario of what was happening. Finally find him again, pre-Google Maps. So I have to physically look at a map and think about if he had crashed where I think he was, where would they have taken him? So I called all the hospitals until I eventually found him, patched him into the board of directors meeting. He told them not to issue a proactive statement. And then he asked to talk to me. And I thought perhaps I was about to be fired from my very first real job. Um, Because almost killing your boss maybe is a fireable offense. But instead he said among the nicest words that have ever been said to me professionally. And he said, And I hear you're really good under pressure. And I start the book with a teaser on that. And I like that you started the interview here because I think it sets a really important sliding door moment in my life and career where him acknowledging that I was really good under pressure did two really important things that changed the course of my life and career after. One was he no longer saw me as the 22-year-old who has no business having this job, who was untested, who may or may not be able to hack it. He could trust me. He could give me assignments of things that far outside my skill set, my seniority, my experience, my playbooks, and trust me to figure it out. I could keep a calm head. I knew how to assemble my experts, and I knew how to ask the right questions to get to the right result. And most importantly, number two is it made me see myself that way, where if Mm. I felt unprepared for a situation or a challenge, or if I'd made a huge mistake or, you know, um, embarrass myself in front of people whose opinions really mattered to me. It almost became my mantra. I'd just be like, well, it's not a helicopter crash. And I could trust myself to just be brave and do the right thing and make the best of it, learn from it really fast, pivot and do better next time. And so that is (laughs) the fiery start to uh, how I got my beginnings in tech, which was very unexpected career path for me. Yeah, you have, um, you have quite the story. (laughs) <laughs> uh, and that was at 20, that was at 22. Yeah. Right? That was, that was just, uh, and were you headhunted? I believe you were headhunted into that job, correct? Not for this one, but this Not is the last one. time, this is the last time I ever interviewed for a job since then. It's always been headhunting. So I graduated from University of Washington, Seattle, which is my hometown in 2002. So we had just experienced the dot-com bust. The economy in Seattle, even back then was very tech heavy. We had Redmond, Washington, which is where my parents still live to this day, is a uh, headquarters of Microsoft. It was just a very, very early tech adopters, um, just like Silicon Valley. So the entire economy had basically disappeared overnight. Uh, while I was studying in undergrad, I worked two student jobs. One was at Suzalo Library, reshelving books. And the second was at the European Union Center, which was really close to my heart because I was majoring in international studies, focusing in Europe. The euro launched in 2002. So this, it really woke up my curiosities to global economies and it made the world feel like a much smaller place. And so, um, yeah, it was kind of in that environment that I was coming out of my undergrad, but I had applied at like a hundred plus places and didn't get a single phone call back, even for free internships, Mm -hmm. just because it was, Mm -hmm. the economy was turned completely upside down, reminiscent of 2008, or maybe even, you know, this moment in time as we're recovering from the pandemic and the, yeah, it's 
it's an interesting ecosystem that reminds me a lot of, of that original timing for me. So the director of the European Union Center is the person who suggested I apply at Amazon because his wife worked in recruiting there. That wow. one offhanded comment changed quite literally the, the course of my life. That's the only reason I applied there. It took me nine months to get that job. But once I got that job, it was like a rocket ship. I have heard, um, actually, one of our team members at Triad actually went through the Amazon interview process, and he has shared so many insights that came out of that. I'm curious, back in 2002, what was that interview process like? Was it super hard? Was it, it obviously it took you a while, but what was that like? <laughs> it was very hard, regardless of what you were applying for. Um, my interview experience is probably an outlier even back then, but it was really, really rigorous because Jeff is a big believer especially back then when we were trying to do things that no one had ever done before. You couldn't hire for the expertise and the experience and the skill set that we needed because literally no one had ever done this before. So what he did was he would hire people who were insanely smart, who had long track records of um, tenacity and ambition and self-starter. And he was looking for smart people that he could teach well, no, he was looking for smart people who could teach themselves to do anything mm -hmm. uh, because that's really what he needed. We were inventing the future. We didn't know what that skill set was. So it was very rigorous. So my first round of interviews, um, I don't even remember what the role was I applied for, um, but the first round of interviews was with every assistant at the company. I think there was like 11 at the time. This is back in the day when Amazon was in a single building. Like, <laughs> what? Uh, do you remember what employee number you were just out of curiosity back in 2002? I don't know what number I was, but I know the total number of active employees was less than 200. And now there's literally wow. over 1 million. So wow. I don't know how many people had come before me that weren't still there mm -hmm. when I joined. But um, yeah, in 2002, yeah, I would say in the thousands probably was my employee number. Um, but yeah, it was a wild time. So it, I did one round of interviews then didn't, I, I loved it but didn't hear back for three months. Then he brought me in for a second round of interviews where he had me in front of all the senior vice presidents, which I thought was a scheduling mistake. I was like, someone's going to be really mm. embarrassed when they realize they put me in this room instead of an engineer. Um, but I didn't know at the time I was being stress tested because there had been a vacancy in Jeff's office. And he actually literally assigned three of his SVPs to find my breaking point and to even see if they could make me cry. Not to be mean, <laughs> but because that's kind of, you had to have a really thick skin to survive in Amazon at all, let alone in the C-suite. And he needed somebody who was unflappable, very calm, you know, used to all kinds of different personalities, just would run really fast and just, you know, the stress of it would just roll off your back. So that's what they were really looking for. And then the final round three months after that was with Jeff Bezos himself. Mm. That's cool. Just knowing, reading your book and hearing some of your background, one of seven kids, yep. your dad grew up on a potato farm in Idaho. Yep. Uh, you were a military kid that moved all mm -hmm. over the place, including Alaska. I'm assuming yep. some of that background really helped during that interview process. Is that fair? Absolutely fair. I think something about being an Air Force brat just kind of forged something, especially since my nature was very timid and perfectionist to a fault, like all the negative connotations of a perfectionist. I would have been really, really held back by that. But being in the Air Force and watching how my mom managed our family, um, you just had to learn to be very adaptable, to make friends quickly, to be self-sufficient, to be self-soothing or self-aspirational, and to really set your own adventure, especially in a military family where where you're living and how long you're going to be there isn't up to you. And so making the most of every opportunity and kind of cherishing each day in and of itself was really important. And watching my dad, who had reinvented himself from the beginning of time, for you can trace my family back thousands and thousands of years. I am first generation non-farmer in my family. My dad was the first one that broke that mold. He saw the lifestyle and he thought he wanted something different for his life and his family. His out was the military. He became one of the elite. You know, he was chosen as a fighter pilot, which is less than 1% of people who make it through through pilot training. And he flew the F-4 Phantom fighter jet. And I was born on McDill Air Force Base in Tampa, Florida. And then my next few sisters in Anchorage, Alaska. And there's just something... I don't know, really powerful that comes from those environments. Watching my dad give himself permission to have a dream that no one around him 
even had, let alone knew how to accomplish. And my mom also being really resilient. And she had never been outside of Idaho in her entire life until she was following my dad around finishing pilot training and to watch her become so strong and adaptable. She was very young and um, she just really made it her own. She wasn't going to sit back and kind of be this lonely military wife. She was going to create a life of adventure for herself. And so she really taught me how to be resourceful and to dream big also. So I think I'm an interesting combination of my my dad's left brainness and my mom, who's an artist, like very creative and emotionally intelligent and somewhere in there uh, created this mm. like this, this skill set that ended up uh, working out pretty well in tech. Yeah. Well, we our time is so limited. So sorry. I'm just I'm just throwing questions at you here. Let's go. <laughs> your your dad's your your dad's call sign as a pilot. You have to share that quick story because that's <laughs> such a fun one. It is. <laughs> so um, yeah, when we were stationed in Anchorage, Alaska, on Elmendorf Air Force Base, there were screenwriters who were writing um, a movie about pilots, and they want they wanted permission to listen to cockpit recordings because they wanted to get the lingo right. Um, pilots love to tease each other. They have very shorthand, lots of acronyms. And so they wanted cockpit recordings to get the script right. So Air Force gave the permission for them to listen to my dad's flight squadrons uh, recordings. That movie um, then was returned to the Air Force and they could approve it or reject it. And they didn't love how the pilots were portrayed. So they pulled their permission to call them Air Force pilots. However, the Navy had no such reservation. So like, sure, call them Navy pilots. Um, and that movie was Top Gun, the original Top Gun. But as they were listening to the cockpit recordings and getting the lingo down, they also kept all the call signs of that flight squadron. And my dad's call sign is Goose. And so the character Goose was based on my dad, who was a good family man. Um, however, he has a couple of objections. He loves that they kept him a good family man. He doesn't love that they killed him. More than that, he objects that they made him a navigator and not a fighter pilot, which he was. And uh, his third and last objection was he's not Navy. He's Air Force. But uh, otherwise, it's a great claim to fame. So I am Goose's daughter, the original. Yeah, that's uh, your your book is so packed with just such a you've had such an adventure of a life, and, <laughs> yeah. and it started it started with your dad. And I'm sure there were there's a lot of other family stories in in your history. Yeah. So let's let's jump to. And by the way, I don't think I even mentioned the name of your book. So bet on yourself, which came out two years ago. Was it 01? Yeah, that released. So a lot of these stories, by the way, if you're listening in and you're like, I need more of this, um, <laughs> we're going to give away a lot of copies of your books to listeners. So, and I appreciate you coming on. So let's jump from, are there any other learnings during your time at Amazon? I'm sure we could fill a whole episode, but if you had to pick one or two things that this is a audience of financial advisors, entrepreneurs, independent business owners out there that could help them before we get to the Google season of your life, what, what would those be? I mean, you're right. This could be a 10-part series if we dissect all the things that I learned from Amazon. It was my personal business school. I consider the greatest privilege that the universe has given me that I got to sit literally at the desk physically closest to Jeff Bezos's in the entire organization for three of the foundational years. Um, if I had to choose just a couple lessons, one I teased already, which was especially when you're starting out as you're scaling, prioritize people. I strongly believe that people matter more than perfecting your business plan or you know, a lot of those other core deliverables they teach you to think about in an MBA. Jeff taught me to prioritize the people and surround yourself with the highest quality people, not only in how smart and resilient they are, but are they honest? Are they passion and mission aligned with you? Um, Jeff really taught me about humble leadership, which usually gets a little bit of a funny look <laughs> when I say, because probably not the first word that comes to mind when you think of at least today's version of a Jack space cowboy version of Jeff Bezos probably isn't humility, mm -hmm. but it is 100% the secret to his success, especially in those early years that I spent by his side. He surrounded himself with people who he not only tolerated, but demanded, tell him the truth. He had a full-time role called The Shadow, which is now called Technical Director, where that person's full-time job was to be at his side, on, copied on every email, in every meeting, on every flight, literally shadowing him 24-7. And that person's full-time job was to poke holes in all his favorite ideas and make sure he was mm. looking around blind corners and didn't get too comfortable and rest on his laurels. 
he knew, he knew he needed someone in that role. And when I look at CEOs now, that's often a big differentiation. When I consider taking on a new client, I often first want to meet their leadership team because it tells me a lot about the character of the CEO themselves, uh, the team that they've chosen to surround themselves with. And then well, like I could go on and on. It's hard. I was going to quickly choose a third, but it's, yeah. it's so hard. I it's, think it's, it's like, it... <laughs> yeah, I go. Think... If you've got one, go for it. Oh, I, I just, it's a floodgate. Now we've opened floodgates. I have so many ideas, but if I had to pick one to wrap it up, the top three would be his risk tolerance, which for me was so eye opening. And it seems like now, at least looking back, it seems like he had a crystal ball and everything was very obvious and the path forward was there and the money printing machine was going from day one. Incorrect. Um, what I really wish people would understand was how much calculated decision-making was going on. We did not know what would work out. There's very a lot of famous results of me- huge failures that Amazon had. But the reason why it didn't break down the whole company and the reason why he was able to be profitable when very few others could um, after the dot-com bust was he considered every decision an experiment. He never just made a decision once and then never touched it again. He would make a decision. And in that meeting, we would then lay out what I now call the uh, green lights and the red flags. We've made a decision today, documented based on these these premises, this information, this data. If our if our decision is correct, we expect to see these following green lights turn on, and very very specifically laid out what we're looking for. If our decision is incorrect, if there's data we didn't have, a premise upon which it which wasn't steady, we will see these red flags show up. And that gave us indicators of when we need to circle back. Either it's all greens, green lights and we need to replicate this decision-making across other areas of the organization or red flag indicators of like time to come back, let's see what's changed in the meantime and let's um, pivot and do it better as fast as possible. So I think that in and of itself taught me probably one of the most important executive lessons um, for me, which is Yeah, consider every decision an experiment. And um, I think that's why Jeff has remained or Amazon has remained very, very, very competitive, even several decades into their journey. Yeah, I love that. Uh, Because I think a lot of times people get so stuck. It's like, oh, this is a final decision Mm -hmm. and it's irreversible. And it's like, no, just look at it as an experiment and yes or no. I love I love that. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, go ahead. Did you have some additional I, it, thoughts there? The way you describe that reminds me of uh, Reed Hoffman talks about it as one-way door or, or two-way doors. And there's very few decisions that we actually make as business leaders that are a one-way door. It's like we can never come back from this decision moment. Less than 1%. Most of them are two-way doors. We can come back. We can revisit. We can go through it in a new way. We can iterate, pivot. And it's actually... I mean, you you want to be decisive. You don't want to constantly be changing or distracting your teams. But I, for me, that is very freeing as somebody whose natural tendencies are perfectionist in nature, and I can have perfectionist paralysis. It is very helpful for me to be like, no, no, this is an experiment. Let's just experiment, gather more data, and then go. Yeah. Well, your your story on you called it his shat. He literally called it his shadow. Was yeah. was the role? Literally the, the official title. <laughs> shadow. Wow. Uh, I was reading, uh, I read the daily stoic by Ryan holiday, and this was a couple of days back, but there was a story in there about, um, these Roman generals, they would go conquer a civilization and then they would throw a big parade when they came back and they would literally have somebody riding behind them in the chariot and they would be whispering in their, in their ear, remember, you will die. Remember, you will wow. die just to keep them grounded. And wow. like, you are not some God, even though all these people are singing your praises, And I'm just, do you have any idea where he came up with that role? Because that's what it reminded me of immediately when you told that story. No one's ever asked me that before, actually. I don't know if he modeled this having some historical reference. He is a voracious reader. So it's very possible that those stories were fresh in his mind. But I've, yeah, I don't know. I I, I don't know where he he got it from. Hmm. I just think that is such a as a leader, the most dangerous thing that Mm. I've seen, I've seen a lot of, I've seen a lot of very successful financial advisors that they're hungry students in the early days. There's no ego. And then as success starts to come along, now all of a sudden ego creeps up and now 
all of those ideas they were open to. Now it's like, oh no, I've got this figured out. I'm I'm kind of pretty good at what I do. <laughs> and I just I just love that role. It's literally to check his ego, poke holes. And mm-hmm. I just think there's such a lesson in that. And that, that has to be a a big piece, an unspoken piece, because I've never heard that story before of one of the reasons Amazon is what it is today. And that original shadow uh, was Andy Jassy, who 19 years later was tapped to become Jeff's successor as CEO of Amazon. That's how long, this is how far in the future Jeff is investing in humans. The people, it's a very, people ask me all the time, what's it like to work directly for Jeff Bezos? And uh, my word is relentless. That is Mm -hmm. a core value of his. He is very successful because he does not give up in the face of adversity or doubt or speculation, or it's just, he knows his vision. He's very confident in it, but I think you're right. He must've seen the need to counterbalance that confidence. He's in insanely smart and always has been since he was very, very young. People knew how wildly intelligent and fast learning he was, but him investing in Andy is just one way that he did that. The average tenure of his senior vice presidents, his direct reports is more than a decade. And if you are signing up for more than a decade to an environment, which everyone unquestionably would agree is relentless, you have to know that you're getting a lot in return. So I would say that's something that he also did as a leader. If you, if you disappointed him or you didn't do your best, you were definitely going to hear about it. He did not hold any punches, but he did that in a way that was investing in you. You knew that you were going to be stronger tomorrow, smarter tomorrow, better tomorrow because of this. And so it didn't wear you down. We didn't burn out because it was what I, my mantra now is that your job should give as much to you as you give to it. And for me, that's been always been a decidedly high bar. And I think that is what I learned from Jeff. And the way he he thought about talent and developing talent and investing in people in the long run. There's a lot of people in the early internet who burnt through their teams and it was kind of like an 18-month like in and out door because people just couldn't hang. Uh, he did the opposite. Mm. All right. Before we get to Google, now I have to ask the question. Um, <laughs> I just I just finished Elon Musk's uh, biography by Walter Isaacson. And yeah. I think people would also describe him as relentless. And I think even the the term they used in the book was he would go into demon mode, right? When he was like, yep. Hey, we've got to, mm-hmm. we've got to get people to Mars. We've got to, you know, build an electric car. And there's a lot of similarities in mm-hmm. Jeff's story and Elon's story, which is they're building things, they're changing the world, inventing things that have never existed before. But I see a different parallel track because Elon is known for just like steamrolling people and then they're gone the next day if they don't get the job done. So yeah. I'd love your take. Have you ever met Elon by chance? Many times. Yeah. Many mm-hmm. times. Okay. Mm-hmm. So um, if you were to say, here's some strengths they share, and maybe here's some differences, I would just love just your quick take on that. I've been thinking about this a lot recently because I'm writing a presentation that I'll be giving at South by Southwest in March. And the title of my presentation is The DNA of Unicorn Leaders. And so I'm really looking at this. One is I want to dispel some myths. And I think this is at the heart of your question is what makes some wildly successful and what makes others inhibited by the exact same character, seemingly exact same character traits. So I think I've come up with like five or so characteristics, which I think are universally true. And to break this down, like a unicorn leader, by that, I mean, someone who's doing something disruptive. It doesn't necessarily have to have that unicorn valuation, although it applies there as well. Anyone trying to do just something disruptive should be looking to these traits. One of those five traits is disagreeableness. I personally, Mm -hmm. I'm not that disagreeable. Probably one of the reasons why I'm a very, very good pair. I'm, I'm a very good match with my moonshot dreamers is because I'm the one in the room who's there with my feet on the ground, reverse engineering these crazy dreams of theirs. Um, I am unwilling. Jeff literally said this all the time. He said, entrepreneurs have to be willing to be misunderstood for long periods of time. And I think that is a characteristic that he and Elon share. They're both very willing to be misunderstood, to have people doubt them, to have people, Jeff had framed in our office, like all these magazine covers. It was like Fortune or I can't remember Forbes or somebody that had the Amazon dot bomb with Jeff's face on it, like his head in a mm. box, a, de- a decapitated Jeff's head inside a box with Amazon dot bomb. He loved it. He had that on the wall as like pure motivation. He was yeah. like, watch me, watch me. This is not over. But the difference there, if we were to take just disagreeableness was Jeff was 
willing to be misunderstood, very confident in his vision, but he was also willing to be challenged. He demanded to be challenged. If you thought people weren't holding him to account, you would get in huge trouble for that. And I think therein lies the differentiation. So with each of these qualities, I have kind of like a Goldilocks methodology with these, where there's there's definitely too hot and too cold of these character mm-hmm. traits. There's too soft and too hard. And I think therein lies the the magic. It's not a formula. There's each of the I've I've worked with hundreds of wildly talented talented CEOs, some of the most effective in the world, now celebrity CEO status. And I see these five characteristics in all of them, but the ones that really excelled are the ones that get the balance right. So you're disagreeable. You can disagree without being disagreeable. You can Mm -hmm. um, have very educated debates. You have high tolerance for risk. Um, You're wildly smart is another one of the five, like your IQ, your tenacity, your willing willingness to put your head through a brick wall day after day after day are some big things. But when I look at the cautionary tales, like, I don't know, fine, name names. I look at the cautionary tales like Elon or like Mm -hmm. Travis Kalanick at Uber or like um, Dan, what's his name from WeWork. Um, I feel like they exemplify the too hard, too strong, you know, um, too hot versions of this. Whereas mm-hmm. those who have been really successful are those who are able to temper themselves. I'm not sure that entirely answered your question. I, I love that answer. I, <laughs> I, you know, based on my readings, I think that's spot on um, from, mm-hmm. I wasn't, I wasn't there firsthand like you were, but um, that makes a lot of sense. Would you say most days Jeff was in the Goldilocks range as far as disagreeableness and the other traits? Most days, not all days. There were definitely some days mm-hmm. where he would just get so mad or so upset or, so, I mean, it's not a perfect human. And this was a mm. long time ago, you know, so I mm. worked with him from 2002 to 2005. I wouldn't want someone to make a summary judgment on me based on mm. <laughs> that two, yeah. two decades ago. But um, that's what I witnessed sitting next to him was most of the time he kept himself firmly in that just right zone where you were being held to extreme account, but you were understood. You had psychological safety to experiment as long as you were the first one to raise a hand and say, I made a mistake and here's my plan forward that's fine. But if you heard about the mistake from someone else, or you didn't know how you were going to fix it, that's not a good day. Um, but yeah, I think that is the art of it. And then as we get into Amazon, this is something that I really learned at an Olympic level from Eric Schmidt, the CEO of Google. I feel like he is almost always in that just right zone. Mm. Well, you, you, you headed right where I was going. So let's, let's do it. <laughs> so, so you move on from Amazon. I think you went back to school for a bit. Did you go back I to did. school somewhere in there? And then I did. Started a okay. doctoral program. So I was in a PhD program at University of California, Berkeley. It was my dream program, but um yeah. So that's why I moved to California originally. Was but then that. but then tech came calling again. It and did. you just had to answer, right? <laughs> so and, but what's what's cool, like before you got to working with Eric Schmidt, chief of staff, you actually spent some time with Marissa Mayer, which is another just I mean, big name in tech, obviously. So any learnings to stop with Marissa um, before we get to the time with Eric? I mean, to do Marissa justice, we would also need a 10-part series. I learned so much from her because she is wildly different in personality from all the other execs I've worked with and taught me some things I don't think I could have learned any other way. Um, She was, her title at the time was uh, VP of Search Product and User Experience which meant she was in charge of everything that brought in eyeballs onto Google. And remember this, is, so I joined in 2006. Uh, Google was not yet the number one search engine, which is unimaginable mm. now, yeah. <laughs> but we were number three at the time. So we were very much. Who were the a, other two? Yahoo? Yahoo. And I think it was. Ask Jeeves? Was it I, Ask that's Jeeves? That's literally what I was going to gonna say. I think so. I think it was wow. Ask Jeeves. Mm. Um, okay. Carry we'll on. Have to I was look just it curious. <laughs> yeah. Let's fact check it. But I think I think that's accurate. It's definitely Yahoo and one other. Um, and so we got we just made cool stuff. Um, other people figured out how to monetize it, but we were just making things that would fulfill the mission statement of Google, which is to organize the world's information and make it universally accessible and useful. So we were making it accessible and useful through the products that we were designing. Starting at Google in the product team was 
just an incredible school again of watching something go literally my first day at Google, Marissa, um, was holding an offsite with the entire product team and everyone was there to present the product of the future, like a product that they thought would be core to human lives 10 years from then. Johanna, who's a very, very talented uh, engineer uh, who was on the product team at the time, her pitch was what, it was like the preemptiveness to Google image search. When she presented the idea that computers could recognize an image and be able to search for those characteristics sounded like absolutely insane, like science fiction at the time. But within a couple of years, we had trained some algorithms. And then now, I mean, we all take it for granted that you can just search for, you know, with, within my Google photos, I can search for like my niece wearing a yellow cow- cowboy hat and I'll have it for you in five seconds. Like, but so anyway, that was my first day. So I watched things go from like conception to launch, to code review, to everything in between. And I really saw how the products were made. And my first day at Google was also the first day that we were using Calendar. They had just created a calendar and we were testing it internally. So you can imagine the mayhem mm-hmm. in the corporate environment when the calendar had disappeared overnight and we were using a new system. Uh, we launched chat. Um, and that was really funny because on the product team, we would always test things internally first within the product team, then within the company, and then we would launch it outside. And when we were testing chat, they told everyone on the product team, add the five people that you ask the most questions of every day and let's you know have your conversations this way every single person on the team i think it was 700 something people at the time added me in those top five and we broke it within like five, five minutes because they didn't expect all that flow to go to but i really marissa taught me to be the hub of the team to be that central mm-hmm. point to you know she called it shark mode many people call it a uh, swan mode where it feels very even on the surface but you're paddling madly underneath she calls it shark mode because she never stops. If a shark stops, they suffocate. So she's always in go mode. Um, but I think if I had to pick one thing, one, it was the way she did code reviews because, I mean, she has a master's in uh, symbolic systems from Stanford, where she also got her CS degree. Um, so she has this incredible coding mind, but she's also very aware of every tiny pixel on the screen, the different gradations in color and how that affects the way you interact with it. She was very much art and science approach, which I hadn't really been exposed to before. But more than that, she really taught me how to motivate teams. We were sprinting marathons at the time. I mean, the pace at which we were launching things is just unfathomable to me now looking back on it. But she made it sustainable for us. She added in celebrations and acknowledgements and she made it a safe place to experiment, to fail. And sometimes we were working on things for years at a time and we would launch it and then some kind of new tech came out, like the iPhone, for example, that made what we just built, put our blood, sweat and tears into completely irrelevant overnight. Mm. And she was able to keep the team engaged and motivated despite these kind of challenges and setbacks. And I think was an enormous part to Google becoming the number one search engine before she left and became CEO of Yahoo. Yeah. yeah. Wow. You should write another book. I know you are, but these stories <laughs> are you. awesome. <laughs> um, <laughs> so, uh, so one of the things that Triad and obviously our clientele are financial advisors all over the country. Um, we build some cool products. Uh, now I won't put them on Google level yet, but um, I'm curious as to if you look at the methodology of which you went mm-hmm. from ideation to actually like it's real world and it exists. Um, I've heard a term from Microsoft where they say you are not your idea, like throw the idea out, mm-hmm. don't attach your identity to it. Mm-hmm. I've seen oftentimes when somebody dreams something up, you're an artist, you build something and then somebody's like, eh, that kind of sucks, do it this way. And so that there's resistance. Was there anything in your learnings there that allowed, because you said you're just getting products out the door so quickly that Mm -hmm. decreased that resistance and allowed people to work together better? I think it does go back to that, what I mentioned at Amazon of learning that decisions are just experiments, not like a final Mm -hmm. touch point. So there was definitely that same culture there where whenever we launch something, and I think this is a differentiator even still today between, for example, Google and Apple. Google, um, we were very open with the fact that we were going to launch this before they were finished purposely. We will get them between 70 and 80% of where we thought they needed to be. And then we put it out in the wild because we were often surprised the way in which our users would choose to use it or integrate it into their lives. And so then we could do that final 20% tweaking to what they were telling us they wanted it to do. Clayton Christensen, 
the late, amazing uh, Harvard business professor, he says, he frames it like, don't lose focus on what your customer client is hiring you to solve. Um, mm-hmm. he, he puts it much more eloquently in his book, uh, The Innovator's Dilemma. But I, we think of that all the time. So Marissa really taught me to love that iterative cycle, to let something go out into the world in an imperfect state, to listen to your users rather than it being a close feedback feedback loop. Obviously, Apple's one of the top three most valuable brands in the world, so it's working for them. But I, th- I see this as a differentiator. Apple polishes it, perfects it, seals the back. You can't tweak it. You can't take it apart like a toaster like you can with the Android phones, for example. Um, and then they tell you how to use it. Works great for them. The products are amazing. But Google does the opposite of that. We want you to feel part of the development process. And so I think that expectation, that constant iterative cycle was really helpful in it. And to go reflect back on what you said at the top of that question, um, at Google, especially on the product team, we would often say to fall in love with the problem, not the solution. Because as time Mm. goes or tech emerges, um, the right solution changes over time, but the problem probably stays pretty consistent, the problem that your clients or customers have, have hired you to solve. Um, so don't fall in love with the solution. Fall in love with the problem and constantly look at your experiments again and say, given where we're at now, what we know now, the more data, new technologies that have emerged, how could we solve this problem in a better, or iterative, faster, whatever way? And I think that's what keeps um, them constantly innovating. Even now, you know, Google's 25 years old now, which is crazy. 25 year birthday in September. And uh, this is how they're staying on the forefront. I don't know. I, th- I think generative AI is going to turn all of tech upside down in the next year though, but they're still very, very, very relevant 25 years in, which is not a small task. Yeah. Uh, I was my first corporate job. I was sitting at my computer buying uh, Google IPOs. So, which at the time I was in IT, that's probably why I'm in finance now, but um, yeah, yeah, it's crazy. That that dates me a little bit when you say that. I still like to think I'm nice and young, but- um, <laughs> Me too, but I'm not. <laughs> I, lo- I love that phrase, fall in love with the problem, not the solution. I'm, I'm borrowing that and taking that one Take back. Take it. So. Okay, cool. So there's your time with Marissa for about three mm-hmm. years um, yep. at Google when she was there. And then you spent almost a decade. Was the whole decade with Eric Schmidt, was that as his chief of staff the entire time? Uh, I invented it mid uh, partnership. So when I was first recruited by Eric into his office, um, he was CEO. Um, he had been CEO for about seven years at that point. And I didn't know, but uh, he had three years left on that. When he was hired by our founders, I still say our, even though I left Google like six years ago, still say we, it's a hard habit to break. That's okay. Um, <laughs> you, helped, you helped do a lot that while you were there. I think that's okay. You earned it. I hope so. I don't think they mind. Um, I, yeah, he was still CEO and he hired me to come onto his team because it takes a long time to build a deep partnership with a CEO, you have to get to that mind reading stage where you seemingly have a crystal ball and you can predict every question they're going to ask and like what they like and hate what they hate. That's years of work to become that mind double. So he wisely brought me in three years before he needed me to be at that level. So I joined his existing team, got to know all the SVPs, built very deep relationships of trust with our board of directors, with our investors, et cetera. And then he became executive chairman. Now, Google had never had a full-time executive chairman before. He'd never been one before. So we really needed to design his role from the ground up. Um, We spent, Eric and I, uh, almost a full year deciding what those metrics were going to be, what his role should be, what did Google need most, what did our users need from him in return. And then I designed his role, his deliverables around that. At the same time, I clearly need to redesign my role because my job is just to make him the most effective CEO he can possibly be, which is a very high bar. Um, but that was my job. And so because his role had changed so dramatically from CEO, which was very internally strategy focused to now chairman, which was almost 100% fully externally focused, I had to redesign my job. So we'd been doing um, a lot of work around external communications and policy, because a big part of his job was really kind of the statesman of tech, where we were translating emerging technologies for everyday users, but also very importantly for um, dignitaries, heads of state, legislators, educating them on these technologies so that they could legislate according to the value of their constituents, 
coming from a place of understanding rather than fear. That was a big part of our job. Mm -hmm. So while we were working with so many policymakers, I saw this job called chief of staff, especially when we were partnering in the White House and working a lot with the Obama administration in early 2008, right? I'm getting my years. Anyway, the very earliest years. Sounds right. I think so. (laughs) Um, I saw this role in government called chief of staff, where it was this right hand thought partner, business partner to the executive who had all the context, who was the sounding board. And I remembered, I thought back to Andy Jassy and I thought that's, that's what Eric needs now. He needs someone who can play that role, who can, who can um, challenge his ideas to spitball um, reactions, to take massive amounts of information and synthesize it down to a single action item or a course of actions. And so I designed my role there. No one at tech at all all had ever been chief of staff. It didn't exist. So it took me a couple of years. It took me almost three full years to convince HR internally at Google that this was a real career path to design Mm -hmm. the job ladder, the metrics, how I would be measured. Um, But now it's, um, so I was the very first one at Google ever and in tech. And now it's pervasive throughout the tech industry, this role of chief of staff that I designed based on the inspirations from government and from what I'd seen at Amazon. And that, so I worked for, yeah, I worked for Eric for a decade and more than half of that. I would say like probably nine years of the 10 years I worked for him, I was chief of staff. How long I officially had the title is slightly shorter, but Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, let's let's hit on that because one of the things I see in the world of finance, and we're fortunate we work with some very successful independent financial advisors, but oftentimes how they get in the business, it's kind of a mm-hmm. solo entrepreneur. We call it the advisor in charge model where they're the constraint. Everything comes through them. Then we help them move to phase two, which we call a business owner, actually true divisions and structure. Phase three is a CEO. But I will say in all three of those stages, even some very, very successful like multi, multi-million revenue firms, there's no executive assistant. There's no mm-hmm. chief of staff on the org chart. So I'm curious your take. Um, if you said, here's an EA role, here's a chief of staff role, here's the difference. Um, mm-hmm. Because I think I think it's an education thing in finance. Like Just yeah. like you kind of invented the role at Google, they're like, wait, what is it? Why does it need <laughs> to exist? So what, what would be your take on that, Anne? This is probably one of the most in-demand questions I've been getting over the last couple of years because this is now seeping out of tech and everyone's kind of heard of this. And it's a very, very misunderstood role for very good reasons. So the reason why it's really hard for people to understand what is the chief of staff and how would I even start to have one in my office is because every single chief of staff is bespoke to the executive that they're partnered with. So what Jeff Bezos needed was dramatically different than what Marissa needed and light years different than what Eric Schmidt needed from me, the same person with Mm -hmm. really the same skill set. Obviously I evolved over time, but um, each of them needed a different thing from their right-hand partner. So to answer your question, um, I look at assistants, there are about five levels. So there's the first couple of levels are administrative assistants. This is when they're learning the business talk, learning the industry. Um, their, Their tasks are very reactionary. This is kind of uh, core skills like calendaring and basic logistics, that kind of thing. Once you get to a senior executive assistant, this is somebody who is anticipating. They're not reactionary. They're very much spending almost all their time in proactive mode, where this is when you get to that crystal ball stage where you you can be a sounding board for your executive's direct reports because you know what your executive is going to ask, what they're going to want, what they're going to like, what they're not going to like. So people can use you as a, a resource and a sounding board that's more accessible than the executive because they're not one single human isn't scalable. So I think of a a very sophisticated, skilled EA as somebody who can anticipate, who's thinking very firmly about the logistics of things, not only conference rooms and flights and things, but how is this conversation going to build upon each other? How do we get to the end goal? They understand the the business goals of each meeting. What is, how are we defining success here? In a way that most, even executives don't really think of it in that way. How do we build line upon line to make sure we get this this result? Then the difference between a very senior EA and a chief of staff, I think comes in strategy. So I think of an EA as somebody who has very high levels of no like and trust factor within your internal teams, but also within the company at large. They know how to connect the dots. They're the cohesive glue between the different silos of your organization. 
they are cross-functional. They're able to cross-pollinate all your ideas. And an EA is making sure that um, that breaks down into your day-to-day calendars, how you're spending your time. Your chief of staff is thinking about it from an industry perspective. They are able to make very long-term strategy recommendations because they understand where the in- industry is moving, how emerging technologies are changing that playing field. And most importantly, they're building up relationships for you outside of your organization, outside of your company walls. So they're known in the industry. They know your equivalents at all your competitors. They have deep networks. And so they're able to bring insights internally and externally for where you need to be showing up, relationships you need to be building, what skill sets you need to double down on, what talent is suddenly becoming available that you need to bring in-house. They sit at a much higher level where they are, they're part of your C-suite, although not compensated in the same way normally, but they have that level of sophistication of understanding in the industry. Um, so it's very difficult to give a broad stroke definition of the differences because as I mentioned, each chief of staff, some are there who have extremely deep analytical skills and are sitting there and, you know, managing all your dashboards. Others are there to help you really with executive communications. Um, There's lots of different kind of niches you can have for a chief of staff, but I would say that's a broad stroke. Thank you for that, for that breakdown. I I think, I think you're, uh, you're, uh, you have the credentials to give us the breakdown there. (laughs) So, um, you know, we, we kind of coach, it goes from tasks to responsibilities, to thinking. And what's interesting mm-hmm. is your description there, kind of as you went yeah. up the assistant, um, that the org chart there, that that actually kind of really aligns. So, mm-hmm. um, okay, I'm, I'm, the, the clock is ticking here. So let's get to what you're doing today. Unless there's any parting thoughts on your time with Google before we go to the book, we go to the leadership strategist and your work with fast scaling startups today. Any last thoughts on Google? I mean, Google will always be home. (laughs) So I could talk for, I mean, literally hours about the things I learned there. But I think it feels like home because it was very much a place that kept up to that promise I made to myself that my job will give as much to me as I gave to it. It did that in spades. And so I'm just very grateful for what I learned. We made a whole lot of mistakes. Every day was not fun. Any days were painful, but it was always worth it. So, um, yeah, I had a blast there. We should, we should do episodes part 112 or something to really dig into all that. Hey, I'm, uh, I'm game. Right, <laughs> okay. Question. Are iPhone, are iPhones yeah. allowed at Google? Yeah. All of our engineers okay. can choose, but if you want an iPhone or an Android and most of our engineers designing products are required to have both because you need to make sure it's working as well on the iPhone as it is on Android. But are you, are you shunned a little bit if you carry an iPhone around? Hundred percent no. In fact, Eric probably had quite literally three or four phones at all times. He was the last wow. person to give up his BlackBerry. Is the truth? Yeah. <laughs> it's been a while <laughs> since to... I've heard heard that <laughs> term. They had wow. to pry it out of his hands, but um, he he, he just loved the cl- he loved the clicking the clicking he of does, the keyboard. It, apparently, it is the keyboard's hard to give up. I still have you ever used swipe the swipe keyboard? I look like a magician. I'll just show oh, it to you. Oh, that something. that you just kind of. It I literally can do a, this without looking at my keyboard and type a whole message while keeping eye contact with you the whole time. Yeah, it's it's magic. I impressive. don't understand how people can type like this on a phone. Yeah, mm, anyway. I have to check that out. <laughs> well, yes. let's get to um, give us, we only have time for a short version. So what, catch us up. What are you doing today? Obviously, we've got the book. We're going to give a lot of copies away, I'm sure, after this conversation. Um, catch us up. What are you up to today? Yeah, I very unintentionally ended up doing what I'm doing right now, which is maybe not the inspiring journey um, that I want it to be. But so when I decided to leave Google, I just I decided to leave because I felt too comfortable. My career always tends to go in three-year cycles where I take on a really big new challenge. I try and conquer it. And then once I kind of feel like I've heard all these questions before, or I kind of am solidly the expert in the room at all times, I always look for something else. I'm looking for I get itchy for a new challenge. Mm -hmm. So after 12 years at Google, I got really itchy and it just didn't seem, I couldn't find it within the organization. Something that would challenge me in the way I wanted to be, grow the skill sets I wanted to. So I decided to do what is kind of a Silicon Valley cliche, which was I wanted to take six months off and just sit, just let my thoughts Mm -hmm. follow my curiosities and discover like what excited me most. Because I've been working for Eric for a decade, he um, had connected me with his personal VC firm called 
innovation endeavors. So a lot of his port- portfolio CEOs were used to coming to me and asking gut checks on things or getting my help. So while I was figuring out what I wanted to do next, <laughs> they looped me in and they said, could I get your thoughts on this project or this hire? Or could I bring you on board for like three months to help me through this particular growth curve? And before I knew it, I had a long consulting list with a waiting list. So now um, I'm five years in and not a single day have I been bored, which is exactly what I was looking for. So now I help scaling CEOs um, tackle some of the problems or challenges that come with growth, specifically around people and operational systems. Those are the specialties that I grew, you know, in my past life at Amazon and Google and are very applicable regardless of what their industry is, what continent they find themselves on. I've kind of learned to pull the silver thread between these things that I experienced in the first half of my career. What are the universal truths that um, are applicable to CEOs of ambition in whatever industry they find themselves in? So now I... I don't have two clients who are in the same industry by role. I don't want accidental conflict of interest. And um, also it keeps me on my toes. It reminds me every day that I'm not there to give them the right answers. I'm there to ask the smart questions, suggest some playbooks and best practices that can accelerate their success in decision making. That's my job in the room, which I think is wildly fun. So every day that, I'm learning. Every, every day has to be a new day. That would be a lot of fun. Um, <laughs> yeah. And you can do it and you can do it from Spain. So that works perfectly, right? It does. It does. Yeah, it does. I spend all day saying good morning. I wake up with Singapore and Tokyo saying good morning, then Dubai, then London, then Germany, then the East Coast of the U.S., West Coast of the U.S. All day I'm saying good morning. <laughs> Love it. Well, one final question for you. So, uh, and this has been an awesome conversation. So thank you so much for carving out some time to, to share with me and, and all the listeners and viewers out there. Yeah. Um, this is the Do Business, Do Life podcast. And one of the things we talk a lot about is work-life integration versus mm-hmm. balance, which is, a you know, by nature, a trade-off. I know that's probably not a normal tech thing. It's a lot more do business, I think, sometimes than do life. But I'm curious as to what that definition would be for you, Anne. I really appreciate this as a final question because I would feel remiss to have suggested like volunteer for all the things and constantly get out of your comfort zone and stuff without touching on the balance part. There is a reason why I haven't burned out on tech um, despite long periods of times of literal 18 hour days. And it goes back to what I mentioned before, which was I, I'm trying to think of where this came from, but From the very, very beginning of my career, I was very clear with myself what I wanted in return. What did I want to learn? What networks did I want to experience? What rooms did I want to be in? What tables did I want to sit at? And so while I was working those very, very long hours and sometimes, you know, like fighting to the death to launch something that then became irrelevant like the next day, I didn't feel depleted by that because I got those expertise. Though I met those people. I was in those rooms. I sat at those tables. And that was really meaningful to me. So, and I think as I'm pondering this, I think I definitely, this was modeled for me by my CEOs. They also made sure they were being replenished because to be a CEO is a very, very heavy burden and it is lonely at the top. It really is. There's not a lot of room for feeling supported. And so all the CEOs I've worked with have been very purposeful in making sure that they have ways of rejuvenating themselves in that energy. And I tried to mirror that back. I could go through their definite each of those three CEOs that we've talked about already have had their own ways of doing that, but they were very purposeful in protecting it and making it non-negotiable. So that would be my advice to the listeners is if you find yourself on the verge of burnout, find something that's rejuvenating, that fills you back up and ideally through your work, that you're getting in return for your very hard work, the things that matter to you the most, whether that's skill set, network, people, impact, purpose, mission, ideally all of the above. Um, that's how you prevent burnout in very, very demanding environments. Love that. Well, and thank you so much for your time. This was an incredible conversation. Can't wait to get it out to the world. And uh, until next time, which I hope is sooner rather than later. Me too. Thank you, Brad. This is a really fun conversation. All right. We'll see you.